Welcome to Plant Prescription, a podcast where Justin Hancock over here and myself, Michelle Opella, talk about plant problems, questions, anything that you lovely consumers have uh, poised to us. And Justin, I'm going to let you introduce yourself since I just skipped right over it. Um, I'm a horticulturist here at Costa Farms. Um, I work with actually across all of our, our lines. Uh, so house plants, indoor and outdoor plant, or uh, um, tropicals, the whole nine yards. Nice. And Michelle? as I said, I'm my name is Michelle. Hello, everyone. My name is Michelle. Um, and I work with bugs. I am uh, an IPM at Costa Farms. And I basically work with bugs and diseases and all that fun stuff that nobody ever likes to see or talk about. Hey, Michelle, what does IPM stand for, for our folks who are not as embedded in in plants? Uh, IPM stands for Integrated Pest Management. So uh, I'm going to go into that just a smidge deeper. Integrated Pest Management uh, basically implies an integrated approach, a.k.a. the use of chemicals, physical, sanitation, and biologicals. So it's an integrated approach, integrated approach to managing pests. And all the pests includes disease, by the way. So that's what that is. Um, Every episode, we jump into uh, questions that you guys sent in. Um, The very first one today comes from Mountain Grove, Missouri. Uh, And Betty asks, it seems like my variegation on my global green pothos is fading. Is this possible? And what can I do to stop it? Ah, variegation is such a tricky one. And I'm not really too familiar with global green pothos. Uh, So, Justin, I'm going to let you take the reins on this. And then I may add a thing or two because I have experience with other variegation. And it's not a pleasant um, discussion. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Well, let's 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 uh, let's let's jump to the the positive side before uh, Michelle rains down on us. Before then. too many uh, <laughs> Yes. Um, so we we have seen on Global Green that the older leaves, especially if they don't get good light intensity, um, they the the variegation can fade. Um, and this is really the 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 situation is really quite common, especially if you grow them like trailing or mounding uh, because the new leaves cast shade on the old leaves. So even if the plant's in a bright spot, um, it's natural for the older leaves to uh, not get as much light if you're if you're not growing them like up a totem or, or trellis. Um, so it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing. I know it, it's not what you want visually, but it's not the plant saying, help, I'm in trouble or a red flag like that. Um, it's just, you know, if, if, if you're able to give it more light or provide light from different angles so that the older leaves, uh, don't get shaded as much, you, you shouldn't see it happen, uh, to the degree. It is funny that you say light because that was going to be my only, uh, recommendation, but in my experience, some of my plants, cause I have very high light in my grow areas, some of my plants will actually variegate less if they're under extremely high light, and then others will variegate more under high light. And so uh, it's good to know that this one is one of those more is more, um, because some plants, uh, what I found is less is more. So I, in any scenario where variegation is fading or not as much, the first thing I would do is just play with the light, try less and then try more. And then pray, depending on the plant. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Um, and then, and then one one note about global green, and I guess pothos in general. Um, so, so Ben is asking about the old leaves losing their variegation. Um, if you see it happening more so on the new leaves, um, especially where it's less fading and and more non-existent. Um, Almost any variegated plant has the ability to revert uh, back to a previous genetic state, and these previous genetic states may not have the the variegation on them. Um, And so in that case, um, if you're finding like it produces two, three, four new leaves, it's in the same light it's always been, um, you may want to clip it back um, so that you can push variegated growth again rather than um, having the, the stem resort to being an entirely non-variegated growth. Yep. Reversion. Hmm. 
Unfortunately, it's genetics, which I'm not allowed to talk about. I promised my professor I would never talk about it. And this is why I just genetics are just such a pain in the butt. Um, anyway. All right. Ready for number two? Yes. All right. This is one that I have no experience with, but I know you have lots of experience with Michelle. Is it aphids? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, I'm going to make a lot of people really mad here and say it's just as bad. Uh, Taylor in Providence, Rhode Island says, how do I keep my cat from eating my houseplants? <laughs> Justin is a dog person. Um, and I am, an every, so. I am an everything person. I'm not cats or dogs, but it, coincidentally, I have cats. Um, so I have two lovely fur nuggets. And um, one of them is very well behaved. And I never had any problems with my plants. The other one um, I had some problems with. Uh, she wouldn't eat my plants the question is about eating plants right correct she wouldn't eat my plants but she did one i don't know if it's better or worse she would she would poop in them here i go talking about poop again uh she would poop in my plants and uh it became a little out of control because i've come home and there's dirt everywhere and probably another form <laughs> number one was probably also in there and it just got out of control. And so I had to train her on that. But the way I trained her on that, I think would probably also be similar to this. Um, so I ended up getting a water pick, which is one of those things that you're supposed to use for your teeth. Um, it's like, it basically just is a little, uh, you charge it in, with a cable and it just shoots a stream of water into your teeth. It's, it's quite pleasant, but quite painful if you're not used to it. Uh, so I had one of those on hand and my mom trained my, our cats with a water pick and so I just picked one up from her and I started whenever I saw Daisy is the culprit's name she's the pooper whenever I saw Daisy <laughs> <laughs> whenever I saw her get close to the plants I would just whip out the water pick and just shoot her with a stream of water which works so much better by the way than those little spray bottles that you see memes about because those don't go very far this water pick depending on what brand you get will shoot like 20 feet and just like a stream <laughs> of water just shooting into like <laughs> the cat. After a while, um, just the sound of it turning on, I didn't even have to physically hit her. Like I could be way off. I could actually just be flossing my teeth for that matter. And just the sound of it would just freak her out. Um, and so over time she started to actually develop a fear of my plan. <laughs> um, which is probably not a great thing, but it is if you're looking to like keep them away from your plants. So that worked for me. It does require a lot of diligence and yeah, your floor may get a little wet, but it's not like streams of water. It's just, it's not, it's not a lot to kind of mop up with the paper towel, but um, when you so said 20 feet, I was envisioning like a fire hose <laughs> <laughs> and like blasting Daisy off of the, <laughs> I'm such a horrible cat mom. That would be so. <laughs> oh God, I I gotta say, like, if you're trying to discipline your animals and they're just not listening, sometimes shooting, quote unquote, not shooting, but hitting them with a blast of water is so satisfying because they just they just can't their feet can't move fast enough. Um, so but uh. Training cats is very difficult. I'm sure that there's other cat whisper people out there that would give you better advice than just shooting them with a thing of water. But that's what I did. Um, if they're eating your plants, I would I would question if they're like eating them or just like terrorizing them and nibbling on them. Um, because I'm like, unless it's catnip or cat grass, I've never seen a cat like eat, eat a plant. I imagine the cat's just being a cat. And it's something new in its environment and it doesn't like it. And it's probably just terrorizing the plant, shredding it to pieces. Um, if it is eating it, uh, just on the safe side, do some research. ASPCA has a good list. Casa Farms has a great list also of plants that are toxic to animals. So if you, if you have any concerns, just look on our website. There's a huge slew of information on there. And if it's a plant that could be in the questionable or danger zone, move it up away. Um, you could put it on a shelf if you're lucky enough. You could put it in a different room. Um, you just so, or you could put something like around it so the cat can't get to it. There's a whole. You can be you can be just as clever, if not more clever, than the cat. Um, Calatheas though are okay, right, Justin? 
Uh, well, Calathias are aeroids, and so they're going to have the the same crystals that Spath and ZZ and, and Monstera have. Okay. So, you know, just reference the site. Like, I clearly, I don't know all the plants, um, but there's, it's all right there. So just reference the site. And while you're training, while you're in training mode, be that with like an actual cat expert who gives you better training advice than shooting with water. Well, I, while you're in training mode, uh, I would just make sure that it's the, it's the good plants. It's the safe plants that you're training on just in case little fur baby slips through once or twice. I don't know. Uh, they, Justin, you don't have cats, but I'm sure you've heard a lot about it. Do you have any other advice? The, the, the only thing I would I would really have to add is is exclusion. Like if you can put your plant in a hanging basket um, on a rod or a hook from the ceiling or something to yeah. physically keep your cat away. Yeah, um, I, I know outdoors. Um, there are products that have like hot pepper oil in that you can spray <sighs> your plants to protect from deer. I don't yes. know if you want to do that with your pet. Because, you know, <laughs> it would create a lot of discomfort. Um, but, they may have something out there for that already, though. They may have, like, a cat stay away. Yeah. You know, there may be, a, like, a softer option than just, like, pure capsaicin oil. <laughs> um, all right. Question number three. Um, I see people talking about growing their pothos on moss poles. Why would you do this? And it is something that I'm supposed to do. Uh, this comes from Jordan in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, and Jordan, this is a great tie back to the, the question about global green. You know, one of the reasons you might want to do it um, is because it allows you to give your plant more even um, light exposure throughout rather than having like the middle of the plant not get as much light and then just the new growth getting the bright light. Yep. Um but Oh. But I mean, when I think of growing things up holes, I'm interjecting now. I have a different mindset. When I think of growing them up, I think of big plants. Uh, so Justin, you and I had a conversation about this when I first moved to Miami, because I remember I saw pothos growing up palm trees. And I was like, what are those? And you're like, those are pothos. I said, like, what? They look totally different when they climb up a palm tree. And essentially, totem poles are trying to mimic palm trees or other things. Um, what happens is as these vines grow up, pothos is one, um, a lot of philodendrons, a lot of philodendrons yeah. fall into this class. When they climb up, their leaves get bigger. I don't quite understand it. And I think I asked you about it and I think I did some research. I don't know why they do this. No, it'll be a mystery. Yeah. One day we'll find out and we'll do like a whole thing on it because I'm dying to know why they do this. If anybody knows why, please, please let us know because um, it's killing me. But what magically, when they go up, the leaves get bigger. And if it is a plant that will fenestrate, aka if it'll like um, develop holes or cutouts in the leaves, this will happen when you train it up. And so a lot of people will train their plants up because they want those big leaves. Maybe they want some fenestrations, things along those lines. It's all personal preference. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's certainly exciting to to watch um, your your pothos do that. Um, you know, when when you first start, the leaves might be a couple of inches wide, uh, but but over time, I've seen pothos get to be like almost twelve inches inside. Yeah. Um, you know, most people don't have enough light or space to be able to get them, but outdoors, they can get twenty four inches across or more. Yeah, I remember I was like, what is that thing in the tree? And it's a pothos. And they fenestrate. Like, yeah. When they get really big, they fenestrate and it's crazy. And one from time, time to time I see, oh, sorry. What were you going to say? Uh, from time to time I see posts that, that make me really sad for people on Facebook uh, because they find one of these big fenestrated golden pothos. And they're yes. like, look, I found a variegated monstera. Yeah, you know? that's exactly what I was going to say. I was like, sometimes, well, sometimes I see bad people i see you out there selling variegated monsteras that are just giant uh, mature pothos leaves shame on you and uh, i see you <laughs> so <laughs> so jordan ultimately it's a case of personal preference you know you can grow it up if you want those bigger more dramatic leaves if you want to keep it away from, you know, children or pets, you can grow it in a hanging basket, let it trail. 
Um, if you want to grow it across a tabletop, a mantle, or other horizontal surface, you can do that too. 100% up to you and how you want your pothos to grow. If you want to get crazy, you could take cuttings and grow it always. <laughs> Been there. Um, all right, misconception time. Okay. Um, it's best if you water your ZZ plant once a month. Well, I mean, I think I, I'm just going to come out with it. I think that's a good starting point. I'm sorry I said it, but I think that's a good starting point. Um, do you have a ZZ, Justin? I do. Well, I have, I have Raven. I don't have regular ZZ. That's, do you know how often you water that? Like, do you keep track of how often you water that? Uh, well, it's as it needs it. Exactly. Um, you know, which is which is my yeah my my go to answer here. It's a it's a misperception because it's it's really best not to try to water on a calendar. Yeah. Um, it's a you know it's a nice guideline if it works, mm -hmm. but it's easy to run afoul of it if you know when it doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you change conditions or um, I, I had a friend who who had house plants in their window, um, yeah. and there was a, a decent sized tree. Um, that that cast some shade during some of the day. Okay. Uh, tree got diseased. Neighbors took it down. Um, and my friend kept watering the uh, her plants on the same schedule. And she's like, I don't understand. I've always uh -huh. watered them every every week, you know. And now they're not doing as well. Um, and it's like, well, it's because they're getting more light. Um, they're using more water, but they're not getting more water. You yeah. Know? And so and so sticking with this same sense of a cadence. Um, doesn't always work if your conditions change. Yep. Yep. I um, agree. Es especially if you first get a plant, I really recommend, you know, watering it, sticking your finger in the soil every, uh, depending on the type of plant, um, you know, a few days if it's something thirstier, um, you know, maybe every week if it's not as thirsty, uh, watering it again and getting a, s a general sense of cadence from there. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, and then, you know, if you feel like you you really need a, a sense of calendar to make sure you maintain a, a watering, um, you know, use that as a guideline rather than just arbitrarily somebody saying, "Well, I water my ZZ every time I pay my rent," <laughs> which I've seen a lot on social Honestly, media. Honestly, that's not a bad way to do it. Um, uh, but it's you know, you you could end up with a with a really underwatered ZZ, yeah, where it's not as happy as it could be, yeah. Um, you know, and this also you know, at the risk of going a little too deeply here, um, you know, there's there's the sense of a plant will tolerate this condition versus like it. You know, your 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 ZZ may tolerate being this dry, but it it's not going to grow as well. It's not going to grow as fast, um, and it's not going to perform necessarily the way it could. And if you're fine with that, you know, then then that could be okay. But if you want your plant to be everything it can, you know, then watering it optimally is best. Yeah, I honestly, I asked the question because I don't know how often I water my ZZ, uh, which is bad. Um, I've got two of them. One of them I rarely water because it's in a dark corner. Um, and then the other one I water uh, every other time I water my plants, which also varies. So <sighs> I think that if you are new and if you are, are nervous, one month is a decent start. Um, but like Justin said, just keep an eye on the plant. If it's wilting, if it seems like it's just always wet, like the soil is always wet, then maybe back off or give it more. Um, all right, plant update time. Do you have one? I have one. I do. Oh. <laughs> okay, what's all yours? Right. You go first. All right, so a few years ago, Michelle and I went plant shopping back when we both lived in Miami. Um, and we found a uh, Raphidophora uh, de Cruciva. Mm -hmm. Um, we split it because it was a, it was a fairly big plant. Um, and I was super frustrated at mine because Michelle's was growing and growing <laughs> and growing and really beautiful. Um, and mine did nothing. Like I swear for a whole year, it did not put out a new leaf, even though no, I was giving it. it great conditions. Yep. Um, okay. So I moved to Oregon. Um, and after a while it explodes into growth, uh, which makes me very happy. It's, it's probably five, almost six feet tall now. Nice. Um, which, which when I first got it, it had three leaves, mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to, you know, to give you a sense of scale. And right now it has two flower buds on it. Ah, the um, leaves are, are the, uh, the flower buds. Okay. We're going to get back to the, we'll get back to the leaves. Tell me about the flower buds. 
Um, so right now the the flower buds are tight, um, light green, kind of minty green, uh-huh. um, and they're what well, I don't. They're maybe the size of a small coffee cup. Oh wow, that's big. Uh, in height, not width. Okay, okay. I was gonna say, wow, <laughs> my God, that's a flower. Have they opened yet? No, so 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 far they are they're still tight. Okay. okay. Um, and it produced one flower bud last winter, and mm-hmm. one really really cool thing, um, is that last year um, it generated heat. Like if you touch the flower, it was actually warm to the touch. That is weird. Why is that? Um, I saw a, a paper on it. I, I didn't read enough on it because I haven't had time. Um, uh-huh. But apparently that's a thing with some aeroid reproduction. That is too cool. Are you going to try to pollinate them? I probably will, just for the fun of it. So, plant update. So you got oh, plant what's yours? Uh, wait, hold on. Before I go to mine, okay. I wanted to ask you about your app. Or we say it totally different, by the way. I think everybody does. Raff, raffidophora? Whatever. I want to, are the leaves giant? And do, are they like all fenestrated now? Yep, yep. So the leaves are 100% fenestrated. They are okay. probably, um, they're not quite monstera size. So they're, they're maybe 30 inches across. Nice. Wow. Cool. Very cool. So it, it took its time to get there, but, mm-hmm. but now, it's, uh, now it's earning its place. Nice. I'm so happy to hear that. So uh, along the lines of seeds and pollinating, if you remember one of the first episodes, my plant update was I had Anthurium clarinervium seeds that I showed here. If if you're watching, that was kind of a moot point for you. Or if you're listening, that was a moot point. But they were big, bubbly orange seeds. And then in another episode, I gave you an update on how the seeds were sprouting and germinating. Well, now they've all grown up. So so cute. All right, I so know. if you're listening to this on um, a service and you want to see it, check us out on YouTube uh, at youtube.com slash Costa Farms. Otherwise, I will describe it. Uh, it Basically, I've got uh, one, two, three, four, five little leaves on my little Anthurium clarinervium baby. It's not showing any of those veins yet because, again, those young leaves really don't show it. But it does have that velvety, like stiff texture to it now. Um, and it's really exciting because, first of all, the seeds took eight months to ripen uh, a human gestation period. Um, and then germinating them took a while. And then the first cotyledon took a while. And now all the way up to this amount took a very long time. It took over. So it took about a year to get to this point. Isn't that crazy? Or no less than a year. A little less than a year, but still a lot of months to get to this point. I'm they kidding. are looking fantastic. Congratulations, Michelle. Thank you. I've got 70 of these little babies. And as I promised, you will be getting one again, committing to Yay. that on air. Probably this one. This is the best looking one. Because you're awesome. Okay. Oh, thank you, Michelle. You are too. Thank you. But anyway, that's my plan update. The, it's, it's funny because it's like this podcast is their little um, like yearbook or like scrapbook of their life. It's like every episode, every couple episodes, we get an update on how they're doing. It's kind of funny. I can't wait until they start to show the venation. I know, me too. It's a seed pollinated, so I'm kind of nervous. We'll see, though. Um, all right, that is a wrap for this episode of Plant Prescription from Costa Farms. Um, as always, if you have questions, please let us know. We would love to feature yours. Um, and until the next time, happy gardening. Bye-bye.